Thanks for joining us here today. If this is your first time or you're returning to us, let me encourage you to go to JesusIsTheRock.org. While you're there, give us an update on how God is working in your life. Now, if He's working life change through our ministries, let me encourage you to give to us financially on the website by clicking the giving button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Thank you so very much for tuning in today, and welcome to Church. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1. You may as well go back to the beginning. Vince Lombardi, great coach of the Green Bay Packers for so long, the Super Bowl trophy still named the Lombardi Trophy, one of the great coaches of all time football. His team lost a ball game one time, and so the next day they went into the locker room, and he said, today we're going to go back to the basics. We're going to go back to the beginning, and he picked up a ball, and he said, this is a football and so from there, he started his talk. So today, we're kind of go, go back to the beginning. Go back to the start. See how, how this thing all started. In Genesis chapter 1, have I got any more light back there? Can you get me some? Y'all know my eyes are not what they used to be. Thank you. Genesis chapter 1 it says, in the beginning, God created, everybody say created. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and dark, covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Then God said, let there be space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of the earth. And that is what happened. God made the space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the second day. And then God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place so dry ground may appear. And that's what happened. God called the dry ground land, and the water seas, and God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they come, and that is what happened. The land produced vegetation of all sort of seed-bearing plants, trees with seed-bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and the trees of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. And evening passed, and morning came, and it marked the third day. And God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them mark off seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day, the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. And God set these lights in the sky to light the earth to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures, and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water, and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good." Then God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed and morning came, marking the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals and livestock and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the wild animals of the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And we'll stop right there for this morning. A couple of weeks ago, I was out on a Sunday and Harvey preached. I haven't listened to the message yet, but he told me what he was going to preach. He was going to preach about the I am's of God and who God is. And I suppose that's what he preached. That's what he told me he was preaching. The very first thing the Bible tells us about God, the very first thing, it tells us that God is an awesome creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he began to create space and, and water and birds and and animals and all of these things. He he created sometimes I think we we hear that so often and we read that so often that we, we quit hearing it and we quit really thinking about it, that God created. It's, it's the first I am that he is. He's a great creator. He didn't duplicate something. He didn't imitate something. He didn't replicate something. But out of nothing, out of voidness, out of darkness, God created the heavens and the earth. That today, scientists and geologists and all of these astronomers and people are still scratching their head trying to figure out, you know, all of the amazing things about the universe and the human body and, and, and animal kingdom and all of these things. And we, we stand in amazement at how these things work together. They work together because God created them. And then God starts talking. Verse 3, God said, let there be light and there was light. Verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness night. Verse 6, then God said, let there be a space between the waters. God starts talking. He created trees and plants and animals and all of these things. And one of the most interesting things about this, he made them all different. You know, God could have just created one species of everything and made everything the same, but, but he made everything different. Even every human being has their own fingerprint. Every human being has their own DNA. Millions and millions and millions of human beings, and no two have the exact same DNA. Each one has their own personality. Even snowflakes, out of the trillions of snowflakes that fall, they say no two snowflakes are exactly alike. Everyone is a little bit different. God, his imagination and his inspiration, his creative genius is beyond, I think, our ability to even grasp. And then God does something so unbelievable. In verse 26, he says, God said, let us make human beings in our own image to be like us. Now I'm going to do something different. Now I'm going to create something, someone, some person, a human being, and I'm going to make them like me. I'm going to make them like us. He says, they'll reign over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals of the earth, the, the, the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Out of, out of himself, he, he made us like himself. Now here's my point. Pastor James used to always say, if I don't tell you this is a profound statement, you may miss it. So this is a profound statement. If we are indeed created like him, as the Bible says, if we're indeed created and made in his image and in his likeness, then that means that we too have in us, born into us, placed into us, the awesome ability to create, right? God had this attribute, God had this ability to create something out of nothing. And if we're made in his image and in his likeness, we have that same ability to take void, to take darkness and create something out of nothing. And we live in a world where mankind has capitalized on this ability. I can remember when I was, I don't know, maybe 
9 or 10 or 11 years old, and we got our first microwave oven. And I thought this thing was from outer space or something. You could heat soup up in 30 seconds. Amazing. You know, just put this thing in, and it would, you know, as long as you didn't put tinfoil in it, then you were in trouble. Then you put tinfoil in it just to watch the show, you know. But amazing. And now, I mean, now incredible cell phones that can do unbelievable things. Any kind of apps that you can think of, any kind of information. I mean, we lose our cell phone today, and it's like we've lost our arm. You know, we, 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 we have to have it. We've, you know, and you got iPads and iPods and all kind of crazy. The Internet is just unbelievable. All of these things, people have created these things. Every day, there are people all across the world who, who, are, who are designated and, and, and to creating new things. And so, you know, as soon as you get used to your phone, they're going to create something else, something that's a little better, a new model. They're always creating. So how does this apply to the church? Unfortunately, it doesn't, not very well. Because for the most part, the church is the one institution that was created to exemplify God, to magnify God, the one institution whose sole purpose is to represent Christ in the earth, the one institution that should be able to look at, the world should be able to look at the church and say, that looks like God. That looks like God. That has, And yet the church, for the most part, is the one institution that refuses to use our God-given ability to create. It's the one institution that seems to stay stuck, that seems to not be willing to create. How many churches in America today look exactly like they did 100 years ago? And 100 years ago, they were great. 100 years ago, they were relevant. 100 years ago, they were reaching people. But today, they're old, they're tired, they're out of date. And quite frankly, it's an indictment upon the church for not using the God-given ability to create that he gave us. He made us in his image, in his likeness. He wants us to create. He wants us to to be able to do things, to be able to use these imaginations that he gave us. He wants us to use this to reach out and change the world. Some churches even take great pride in not changing. We get all spiritual and say, bless God, we're, we, we do things the same way we did 100 years ago. We do, you know, and if it was good enough for grandpa, it's good enough for me, and give me the old-time religion. And, and I don't say this to be critical, but church, that's the most selfish, lazy, unchristlike attitude I've ever heard. God made us to change. God made us to create. He gave us these wonderful minds. I mean, the God who created sunflowers and roses and porcupines and giraffes and these crazy things. These, he made mountains and valleys. The God who made us like him, his representatives in the earth today, sit back and we go to boring church once or twice a week, sing boring songs, pray boring prayers, and listen to boring sermons. And we refuse to create. We refuse. And we have the audacity then to call ourselves Christians, which means Christ-like. And there's nothing Christ-like about that. Have you ever seriously looked at the ministry of Jesus? Have you ever seriously just kind of walked through and read you know, just read the Gospels and read about the ministry of Jesus. One minute, he's standing on the bow of a boat, and that's his pulpit. He's preaching to people on the shore. He's not in a church behind a pulpit. He's standing on a boat. The next minute, he's making up great stories about lost coins and about prodigal children and about kings and banquets, and he's telling these elaborate stories to illustrate his point. He's laying hands on sick people, and they get well. The next minute, he's having dinner with a town tramp and he's hanging out with lost people and the scum of society. He spits in the dirt and makes mud and puts on a guy's eyes and his eyes are open. I mean, Jesus was amazing. He had this, he talks to fig trees and they wither up and die. He sends his disciples to go get money out of a fish's mouth. I mean, Jesus was a, he was on the cutting edge. If there's ever been anybody on the cutting edge, it was Jesus. He was so creative. He didn't do things normal. I mean, he, you, you, you know, he was, he was controversial. He was, uh, he, he was laughed at. He was scoffed at. He was, uh, you know, ultimately crucified. He was anything but normal. 
You can never never accuse him of being normal. You can never accuse him of being boring. He was always stirring up things everywhere that he went. He He had this incredible, and why not? He was his father's son. He was his father's son. He was radical. And here we sit, and how it must break the heart of God to see his kids, his church, just become normal. Just get stuck in a rut, how it must break the heart of God for his church to become the most boring institution in the world. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know something exciting is going to happen. I I, I can't wait to get to church because I know something is going to happen. Something's going to be there. God's going to do something. You know, it ought to be exciting. Our kids go to school and they work on the latest and greatest computers. They learn the latest skills. They're taught things. Now they're taught things in, in elementary school that, you know, we weren't taught to college. You know, they're, they're, they're taking algebra in elementary school. I didn't take algebra until I got to college. You know, they're, they're learning these things. We go to work and we work on complex projects and we work with expensive machinery many times and all kinds of different crazy things. We go to the grocery store and they're just scanning our stuff, you know? I mean, 20, 30 years ago, nobody was scanning stuff. They were looking at a price and punching it in. But now, you know, everything is, everything is moving forward. Everything is, is happening everywhere except the church. Then we go to church and we got the same tired old routine we've been doing for 100 years. Jesus said in Luke 16, 8, He said, the people of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. What an indictment upon the church. The people of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. Here's my point. That would all be okay. That would all be okay. uh, but, But here's my fear. I don't care about change for change's sake. I even like, I like the old hymns. I like the, I like the old traditions. I'm not for abandoning all that. I thank God for my heritage. But here's my fear. If we don't begin to allow ourselves to change and to grow and to use our God-given ability to create fresh new ways to share the gospel, then we're absolutely, church, going to lose our next generation of kids. We're going to lose our next generation of young people because we're either too stubborn, too proud, or too lazy to change and grow and create. A young man walked up to me in the foyer one night after church, and he said, Pastor, he said, I just want to say thank you. And I said, what did I do? And he said, I just want to say thank you for having a church like this church because if it weren't for this church, I know for a fact I wouldn't be in church. I wouldn't be in church anywhere. Listen, I'm not trying to tell you this church is perfect or we have it all together, but I am saying that that I'm committed to using whatever God-given talent and creativity that we have to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I like to surround myself with creative people. I'm glad that we have a creative staff. I'm glad that we have creative elders that will come together and say, what can we do to reach more people? What can we do to, to move one step in? Our goal is always to get better before we get bigger. Before we get bigger, let's get better. Because if you get bigger without getting better, when you get bigger, you're going to be in trouble. We have to always be trying to get better. So what do we mean by creativity? I mean finding relevant, fresh, unique ways to share the gospel. It's as simple as that. It's discovering your God-given talents and figuring out how to use them to reach people and teach people and train people and evangelize people. Nothing wrong with old ways, nothing wrong with standing and preaching the gospel, nothing wrong with going out and evangelizing and knocking on doors. But but honestly, uh, it doesn't work well to knock on doors today. 30 years ago, it was great. People would open the door and they'd be glad to see you. Now, folks don't want to be pestered with somebody. Now, first of all, they think you're Jehovah's Witness. Right? And you don't want to, I mean, I don't even like politicians knocking on the door and handing me flyers. You know, it's just, that's the, it's not the day that we live in. But let, let me give you just a couple of examples. 
I preached a message one time on the, on the, the, the parable of the talents. And you remember there was a king there and he had three servants and he gave each one of them some money. He said, I'm going on a trip. And he said, he gave them money as their ability to handle the money. So he knew them a little bit. He gave one this amount of money and he said, I want you to take it, take this amount of money. I'm going on a trip. He gave the second one. He didn't have quite as much confidence in him, but he gave him a little less money. And then the third one, he didn't have quite as much confidence, but he gave him an amount of money. He said, now take this money and invest it, do something. When I come back from my trip, we'll see how you're done. So he goes on his trip and he comes back and the first guy comes and said, uh, master, here's your money. Plus here's double that. I invested it and doubled your money. And he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. And he went to the second one. The second one, he didn't have quite as much to start with, but he said, I took what you gave me and I doubled it. Here's your money plus double. And he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. And the third one came and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, and I was afraid if I tried to invest this, I may lose it. So I took and dug a hole, and I buried it in the ground. I kept it safe and sound, and here's the money you gave me. And the king looked at him and said, you slothful, lazy servant. He said, at the very least, you could have put it in the bank and made interest but you buried it in the ground. You were afraid to take a risk. You were afraid to take your, you, you, were, you were wanting to play it safe and you were lazy and slothful. He said, I'm going to take what was given to you and I'm going to give it to these other guys. Too many churches today are content to play it safe. Nobody wants to invest anything. We don't want to take a risk in anything. I've tried lots of things that didn't work. But every once in a while, we'll try something that will work. I preached that message one Sunday morning, and I remember at the end of the message, we gave out $10 bills. I said, here's $10 bills. We had a stack of $10 bills. I said, when you leave today, walk out, get your $10 bill if you like it. Just take it. I said, take it for two weeks. In two weeks, we're going to see what happens with it. 40 people took us up on it. We gave away $400. 40 people took $10 bills. And the next two weeks were some of the two of the funnest weeks that I've ever spent in church, watching what people were doing, listening to people's stories. Some people bought, used their $10 and they bought stamps and they sent out letters to their friends telling them what we were doing. Some people took their $10, one guy took it and he bought gasoline for his lawnmower and he went out and cut, started cutting yards and he started making money for cutting yards. Somebody else took their $10 and they went to the store and they bought stuff to make cookies and cakes and stuff and they went to Walmart and they sold them out in front of Walmart. All these ideas were just buzzing around and, and different things, one creative idea after another. I, I pulled all strings off, no strings attached. Do whatever you want to do with your $10. Two weeks later, everybody brought their money back in, and the $400 we gave away was turned into $4,000 in two weeks' time because people just got creative. They just started seeing whatever they could do, and they invested their $10, and it came back, and it came back uh, $4,000 from $400. Some time back, I had $1 bills and I think maybe some fives and whatever. You remember, I just threw them all over the steps and I invited people to come take them. If you want them, come take them. A few people got up and come got them. A lot of people didn't. And I talked about the reasons why those came to get them and the reasons why some people didn't. And I related that as coming to Christ. And we have the same reasons for coming to Christ or not coming to Christ. Some people thought, well, uh, I don't really need that. I'm going to let somebody else get that. Some people were just saying, you know, I'd feel a little ashamed to come up and do that. Whatever the reason, some people didn't. And I related that in a sermon. And as a result, we had about 25 people come to Christ that day because they realized the same reason I didn't go get the money is the same reason I hadn't went and accepted Christ. Either I think I don't need it, somebody needs it worse, or I would be embarrassed, or I would do this, or I would do that. One year, just before Easter, just as we were finishing this building, this building has just been built, and, and the contractors were doing just a few things on the inside just to finish it off, and I remember I was out of town, but I called them, and it was on like a Thursday or a Friday. And I was working on my message for that week and I had this idea and I had this thought and I called my contractor and I said, hey, I need a bridge built. 
And he's like, you need a bridge built. I said, yeah, I need a bridge. He said, what kind of bridge? I said, I don't know. I need it about 12 or 15 feet long. And I just want it to kind of be a little arch like would go over a ditch and I want some handrails on it. And, the, and he said, uh, all right, yeah, I think I can build that. He said, when, when do you want it? I said, Sunday. <laughs> He said, you want it by this Sunday? I said, yeah, this Sunday. I'd like it painted white if you can do that. And so I come back in Saturday night, and I remember I stopped by the church, and sitting right up here was my bridge, all painted up pretty. And I preached that next Sunday about moving from darkness into light, and I talked about the bridge being Christ, of how we, we move. And over 50 people that Sunday came forward and didn't just stop at the altar, but they came up and they physically walked across that bridge as they accepted Christ and they said, I'm moving my life, moving from darkness into light. I'm making that step. I'm making that step of faith. It was just a little thing, but it's something they could, they could put with that. It was something that was different. I preached one message called Missing in Action on Father's Day. And I preached to absentee fathers, talked about people, fathers who were absent, sometimes even in the home, but still absent. They're, they're missing. Sometimes they're there in body, but they're missing in action. They're not being the fathers that they're called to be. They're not being the husbands that they're called to be. And I called it missing in action. And I preached it in full army fatigues, face paint and everything. I preached the message. And we had about 25 fathers come that day and rededicate themselves to Christ and to their families and to their kids. It's just finding a different way to be relevant and and, and preach the same message. I said, we, we don't change the message, we just change the method. Some of you remember I brought in fruit trees just a while back, remember that? Because we talked about Christ is the vine and we're the branches. And so it just gave us something that we could see. I had a scale built over here. We did a series on balance and I had a big scale, had a big balance beam over here. It's, not, it's, it's just little things that we could be creative to help people relate I love what Paul said. Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And if it takes doing things differently than maybe just standing here, maybe doing it this way, if I can do it this way, then let's do it. By all means, whatever means, if I can save some. It's just using the gifts of creativity that God's given us. Again, we are incredibly glad that you joined us here today at Church you to go to the website. There you can find any of our archive podcasts. You can send us an email about how God's working in your life or a prayer request, or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking the giving button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.